now have the honor of introducing our next speaker, and that is none other than uh, Dr. Esther Mambo. She is lecturer at St. Paul's University in Lemuro, Kenya. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Mambo. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I don't know whether it's for everybody that uh, when you really want technology, then it stresses you instead of cooperating. Uh, and that is what mine is doing at the moment, but I do hope that it will obey. I have to command it. <laughs> to <obey. laughs> I'm not sure I have the powers to command technology to, to obey. But thank you so much for, for the, the, the space and for uh, allowing me to, to share this space. Uh, uh, I've, I've always heard about uh, Emily Towns and read and every time I've had students from the US to visit and they keep quoting her, so it was really nice. And what they've said and quoted about her is really true. I have seen it and uh, I, I have had it. So thank you, thank you so much. I was going to say, do we really need to continue? We should all say amen. <laughs> and we, 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 we go our, our separate ways, but uh, I'm also going to add my voice to, to this uh, uh, conversation, which has been very liberating uh, from yesterday, uh, seeing my own colleague, friend and student, Reverend Adera yesterday, I said, oh, when was he doing all that? I did not know, but uh, wonderful. I do hope that we can continue researching and working uh, uh, with him. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I wasn't sure what I was accepting to do, but now that I'm here, I'll do what I think I accepted to do. <laughs> When I was asked to send a quote, I said, I sent a quote by Masi Oduoye, that theology is something we struggle to do, not something we receive. At the same time, because we are in the COVID uh, situation, I had seen another quote by one of the uh, preachers, he's a bishop actually, and he said, this pandemic is not teaching us how to build a house. It is exposing what kind of house we have built over the years. And it is those two uh, aspects that I'm going to talk with as I uh, talk about theology from my own context at two fronts, first, about women and two about the LGBTI plus community. So I'll raise some of those things as I see them from my context. My own theological framework is largely informed by the fact that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. And so all people are created by God regardless of their color, gender, class, religion, sexual orientation, health status, name them. So when we talk about African Christianity or Christianity in Africa, I will be pretending to say that I'm a representative of that. But I can follow scholars like Odioye, Kwame Bidiako, Pobi, Mwaura, who have written about Christianity in Africa and say Christianity is an African story. And that story is told in varied ways. There are those who tell it by quoting the numbers, saying that there is a shift of Christianity from the Northern Hemisphere to the, Afri to the Southern Hemisphere and Christianity is, is, and Africa is one of those uh, spaces. And there are those who talk about it in terms of theology and say the church has grown evangelically uh, without corresponding theologically, liturgically, and economically. 
And that becomes a situation of lamentation. But the reality is that when it comes to issues that affect society economically, we get very little support from those who claim that Christianity has come to Africa and is very strong. Many of the denominations in my own country are about 200 years old, although Christianity has been in Africa for years, especially in North Africa. And that Christianity produced a lot of the theologians and the theology of the church, especially in the West. So choosing to go to study theology myself, my first theologian was my grandmother. My grandmother who for her becoming a Christian was a very challenging aspect because her brothers could not allow her to go to the mission station because they would lose out in terms of her bride wealth. And so she would show me marks of her of, of, of choosing to be a Christian and struggling and suffering in the community. But become a, becoming a Christian for her helped her to read and write and understand Christianity as it was presented to her by the missionaries. When I chose to do theology, she's the one who supported me. And she said, in terms of describing the church, having been in the church for a long time, she said, the church is a place of jackets. Something that I later understood, that was her words for patriarchy in the church. So anytime I was faced with a challenge, I went to her because all the Bible stories, she's the one who had taught them to me. One of the stories that she taught me was the story of Jacob wrestling with God. And she always reminded me that when you have chosen to do theology, to serve the church, you will always be wrestling. You'll be wrestling with issues around you as a woman, because it is not easy. Women have not been accepted in the church, in leadership, in teaching, in theology. And so I'm using the metaphor of re wrestling as I present my aspects in liberation theology. The fact that theology is not something that we receive well packaged, it is something that we struggle with according to Masi Uduye. So what is this? that I can say from my context, we struggle with, or we wrestle with. We wrestle with historical injustices over people in the continent and in other parts of the world. When we think of history of Christianity in Africa, for example, we realize that since the continent came into contact with the Northern Atlantic, most of the people have labored and suffered and have been victims of slavery, of, of ideologies of slavery, colonialism, racism, to name just but a few. For with the Bible in one hand and the flag on the other, colonialism spread, creating the empire. With the power brokers, it was like the COVID virus spreading throughout the continent. The, black, the author of Black Body Women Colonization in Space notes with great insight that in colonial Kenya, as in the United States, bodies like the land had to be controlled, dominated, fixed in time and space. The construction of darkness being trapped 
within the web of nature, whereas the white body had the freedom of movement. The black body did not. So the domination of black bodies, whether it was in the, in the North or in Africa in colonial era, was inclusive of all those who did not fit the definition of being. It is Jenny Tepa, a theologian from New Zealand says that within colonialism, there was a denial of moral, legal, or spiritual duty to act towards redeeming any and all aspects of what can now only be described in large part as inglorious colonial histories. Histories repeated with all of the traditional hallmarks of colonialism. Exploitation of both labor, exploitation of the rich economic wealth, creating inequalities among indigenous people. These ideologies of colonialism were aimed at killing the black people, excluding the queer bodies, shaming women, depriving the poor, and degrading everyone who did not look white. So the political economic ideologies of colonialism were as well religious and ethical because they should have been raising concerns about the image of God in all God's creation. These ideologies did not even bring to light the kingdom values of truth, love, and justice, peace or reconciliation. Even though when Africans began to read the Bible and realized that the Christian message of salvation or life in abundance could not be maintained in the web of hunger, poverty, and violence. They failed to see what salvation or life in its fullness meant. So when we think of the liberation theology, therefore, what is being brought to light is that the liberation theology must include all the gospel's kingdom values, whether they are socioeconomic or they are political. The story of mission is about proclamation, evangelism, and socio-ethical imperatives of the gospel. The liberation theologians from Latin America reminded us about God's preferential option of the poor. Not exclusive option, but preferential option of the poor. It is in the same regard that the Nobel laureate for economics, Amartya Sen, in his own way, gave a secular translation of this when he argued that an economic policy has validity when it considers its impact on those on the downside of the national and world economy. So the challenge of social deprivation is one that Christians within my own continent or my own country have to grapple with every time. So how have our Christians dealt with that? While there is a lot of importation of forms of the Christian faith that deny engaging with the social realities, there are those that I've noted it is important to <clears throat> engage with the social realities. Some of those are women. And I speak about matriarchs 
within the circle of concerned African women theologians. Matriarchs who realized that they had agency to speak against their own marginalization and domination. They noted that it was important to talk about decolonization, to challenge patriarchy within Christianity, patriarchy within African culture, and patriarchy in colonialism. As Masi Ambaudioye argued, that unless research about women is done by the women themselves, they'll always be considered as though they were dead. So the African women matriarchs have all along engaged with that which has excluded them, with that which has been uh, uh, dominant. They have engaged with the Christian faith from a position of seeking liberation. While male theologians were happily talking about Africanization of Christianity, enculturation of Christianity, the African matriarchs argued that unless one looked at power within culture, it was not significant to claim it. Simbi Kanyuru, for example, noted that while affirming the need for reclaiming culture through the theology of enculturation, we African women theologians make the claim that enculturation is not sufficient unless the cultures we claim are analyzed and are deemed worthy in terms of promoting justice and support for life and dignity of women. <clears throat> so the matriarchs of the Christian faith, members of the circle of concerned African women theologians critiqued patriarchy in all its forms. Writing about pat patriarchy, Nambura Njorogi observed that patriarchy is a destructive powerhouse with systematic and normative inequalities as its hallmark. It also affects the rest of the creation order. Its roots are entrenched in society as well as the church, which means we need well-equipped and committed women and men to bring patriarchy to its knees. So the women critiqued patriarchy that was strong within the ecclesiastical bodies. Patriarchy that was used by ecclesiastical leaders in the name of the Bible and in the name of the gospel. The women began taking seriously, analyzing their situation, whether it was at the political front or at the economic front. They were able to uncover oppression, exploitation, alienation, and discrimination. And they did this by interpreting their own experiences within the context of the church and the society. The women began challenging colonial theology, colonial theology, which they said was a theology that never helped them to critically question about the wrongdoings within society. They call for a theology that would help them to be able to stand against the wiles of the evil one, to speak against suffering, misery, and death. The women brought out issues around health and healing as they have today, even within the pandemic. The women spoke about needing a theology that would creatively help to retell the story of colonization, cultural and 
religious imperialism and the people's resistance and struggle for freedom, particularly freedom for land. As well as the role of decolonizing theology, bringing to light hegemonies that were deeply entrenched in imported theologies. It opened up room for LGBTI community to, began, to begin to raise their voices. We heard from Reverend Adera showing yesterday how oppression, discrimination of LGBTI communities is based on cultural taboos, religious uh, texts, and social hostilities, and sometimes legal prohibitions or media censorship. What the matriarchs of theology have done is to be able to bring to light that texts can be used to deny liberation. But the matriarchs of theology brought to light was the idea, not the idea, was the issue that even some of the laws about LGBTI community are colonial. While some laws have been reformed, but these colonial laws have not been uh, uh, reformed. The matriarchs brought to light the idea that the bodies of people have been described via the language of colonialism. And the bodies of LGBTI people, uh, persons, have been sites of both colonial production of, have been sites of contention using the colonial language. So the matriarchs began reading texts, having been exploited themselves, understanding the lives of the other exploited people. It is in this regard that I personally have taken time to read texts with religious leaders. Text of terror against women, text of terror against LGBTI people. Throughout my research, working with them in silent diplomacy, seeking for allies who can be empowered to speak publicly against the policies of discrimination. In a book that just came the other day, I was asked to read and review it. And I realized that the communities of LGBTI people who cannot do research themselves are being studied by others from outside. While the matriarchs of theology in Africa have challenged even ways of knowledge production that does not bring to light the realities of those that are exploited. Because religious leaders, when they are challenging LGBT, LGBTIQ communities, use the Bible. And one of the texts that they keep raising is Genesis 1, 28, be fruitful and multiply. And this is echoed in the broader community. But the matriarchs have even challenged this. Matthew Duyoye, for instance, argues that this understanding of production is based on the assumption that every person has to produce children and there is only one way to have children. As Masio Duyoye, a childless woman in the West African state asks, where in the Bible 
are the children of Miriam, Deborah, Esther. Where are the offsprings of Mary, Martha, John, and James and Priscilla? While producing children, she argues, is important. Not everyone has a capacity to produce children in the way in which society is accustomed. As such, those who are unable or choose not to father or birth children for a variety of reasons have other ways of raising the next generation. This includes playing other rules, including caring for the many children that are in need. Linking fruitfulness solely to giving birth to children misses the mark because it is only one among many things that human beings are commanded in the Genesis story to do. More deeply, it does violence to those who are unable or decide not to have children. Further, in the story of the church, we have groups made up of individuals who have not given birth to children, but have been fruitful in a myriad of ways, including by acting in the just and merciful ways. There are those in the society who are in the caring, caring for the earth, engaging, caring for the earth. There are also those who look out for the many who are denied justice in, in society. So the call for inclusivity and giving others a voice is among the many forms of fruitfulness. So in that kind of study, rereading the text and interpreting it, is one way that we find the cosmopolitan affirming church that Reverend was speaking about produces or creates a safe space for people to reach, to pray, and to worship, living the life of the gospel teaching of Jesus Christ. So due to colonialism, classism, and patriarchy, we find that LGBTI persons have suffered exclusion and marginalization at different levels of society. Their experiences are often reduced to anecdotes and treated as irrelevant. But we have leaders in the country and in Africa who have affirmed persons, the LGBTI persons in the community. One of them is the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who in 2010, wrote that he equated the discrimination of the LGBTIQ people with the horrors of Nazi Germany and apartheid era of South Africa. He argued that these are family, part of the African family and part of God's family. And they should be treated like members of the family. And Bishop Tutu is not the only one who speaks for and about persons, about LGBTI persons and about women. So when we have a moment like this in terms of talking about liberation theology, it is a Kairos moment. It is a Kairos moment because it gives us opportunity to rethink, to rebuild, and to offer redress from the prophetic tradition of justice. It is a Kairos moment, even if we have had other Kairos moments. And so for me, I want to offer three R's in order for us to continue this good work of challenging and critiquing evils of society colonialism that continues to be extended, if I may uh, say uh, something here, that the uh, Anglican Church of Kenya has just appointed two women bishops. But there is an organization that has written to them to say, how dare they do that? What about authority? Because women are not supposed to have such authority. So where is the autonomy? of these churches. It seems that we continue to be followed by the old colonial imperial magisterium of domination. 
And so I offer th these three things. One, it is to talk about this Kairos moment and let's talk about repentance. There is the need for repentance. It's an act of repentance. We should recognize our complicity in perpetuating the spread of the hegemony in all its manifestations, in terms of racial injustice, capitalism, and economic inequalities. Maybe the scene of what others have called white superiority. Issues around hunger and sexual and gender-based violence, to name just but a few. This requires a radical move to shift, to realign the balances of power by recognizing the worth and dignity of all hum humanity as being crafted in God's image and likeness. The concept of the image of God as espoused by post-colonial and other theologians reestablishes God at the center of the mission project. In so doing, stewardship rather than injustice, inequality and imbalance of power restores breath to humanity to fulfill God's mission for the world through the church. The justice of God resists arrogance, which treats people as less than fighting for the leftovers instead of living in the abundance they deserve. The justice of God requires the equipping and offering of agency and amplification of voice rather than the perpetuating of dependence, denigration, and absence of human dignity. When I think of how we relate, sometimes the African church is used to fight battles that are not their battles. When people have been defeated in one area, they come to Africa to get Africa to join them. But the truth is that they are not even interested in the issues that affect the Africans themselves, but they just want to be joined for the sake of being joined. They don't challenge the systems that continue to denigrate right, the Africans. The second thing is redress. I want to submit that not only do we realize what the mission of God is just by realization, it must be seen and felt just as the injustices are felt and seen by those who have been for a long time denied breath, who have been living under the heels of religious hegemonies. Women, as I've said, LGBTI uh, group persons. In terms of redress, one is saying that an older order of words cannot suffice. We have seen cases where leadership of the church offers verbal for, uh, 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 verbal repentance or uh, 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 for, asks for forgiveness for what has been done in the past, sometimes in the history. But there is much more than that, than just the offering the verbal uh, 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 repentance. There should be a recognition that it is important to continue to interrogate the colonial heritage, for example, patriarchy and sexism that continues to be in the church. We need to interrogate further our religious and secular hegemonies that embody sometimes whiteness as normative. We must therefore interrogate what justice looks like for women, for girls, for children, for LGBTI uh, few persons. This may include affirming and utilizing the leadership skills that they bring to the table. I speak from a position where 
leadership for women is still not easily obtained. Finally, redemption. In as much as the Bible, liturgy and tradition have been used as a point of contact in regard to religious hegemony, we must also explore how we might move away from reading the text with a hermeneutic of suspicion so that the text is not used ideologically to further enslave those on the margins. It is always quoted to us, the authority of scripture, the authority of scripture. And you are wondering, is it your authority or, or is, is it really the authority of scripture? It is time for redress, but it's also time to liberate people from under the yoke of hegemony of offering a balanced exegetical framework in the recognition and affirmation of non-traditional forms of biblical criticism to exhume the text and to ask why question, which I think my sister Amy Towns also was asking. Be willing to acknowledge conviction from the post-colonial readings of the biblical texts, including the well-loved stories and texts of terror, to engage with theological principles around justice in the context of empire. How much are we to be engaged in such projects, moving away from the giving motif to a sharing motif in order to create partnership of mutuality rather than what I would call the virus of hegemony of domination and exploitation, making the poor poorer. I'm, 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 I'm finishing. It is in this regard, therefore, that when we work with women, we work with LGBTIQ communities, that we still center our work through the Bible, but reread those texts in a more liberating manner by sharing with religious leaders rereading those texts and helping them or creating safe spaces for them to be able to understand that the answers don't only come from the North, but the answers can also come from within themselves. And it is by giving, creating spaces of knowledge that I have found that as empowering both for my students and for those that live on the margins. Hence my favorite text, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I'll also ignore your children. But I do not want to finish with that harsh prophetic message. I do want to finish by saying that by giving people an opportunity to seek knowledge, they are empowered, hence able to fight for justice because of believing in a God who is a God of justice. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Let me just say, this is not an enviable post that I have, can I just say? Because, because I have to keep constraint. And if I could tell you the pages of notes I have, and we haven't even gotten to you, Dr. Dorcas, I'm just like, okay, let me just try to pull my brain in because there's a million things I wanna say, but thank you so much for that powerful sharing. As you were sharing, one of the things that came to mind was an experience I had many years ago where I, uh, had the fortune of being able to do some development work in Ghana. And while there, in addition to the work, they you know, took us on some, a tour around the area. And I remember going to visit uh, the slave castle there, right on the coast. And what was striking to me was 
uh, when walking into the facility, um, there was something so noticeable. Right at the very front, the first thing you see is a huge church, this, this white church that's just right there. But if I walked to the left, which is where I went, it was to the area that was the uh, place where women were held, the captured women were held. And I remember walking into this room and seeing a stairway in basically what was just a carved out stone area. And I remembered asking, well, what is the, what do those stairs lead to? It just seemed like a strange thing to have in a cave, you know, these stairs. And they said, oh, well, that's where, you know, whoever was the, the, the chief caretaker of the area would be. And they would basically have the opportunity to pick the virgins from that space. And I remember touching the wall and feeling the energy of those who had passed through that place where there was the women's holding area, the men's holding area and a punishment space in the middle, but all of that centered around the church because it was so critical to them that that process of colonization begin before passing through that door of no return. How do you, in that context, sift out <laughs> white, the impact of white colonization as it relates to Christianity? And I don't even know if sift is the appropriate word, but as you've challenged us in such a powerful way to reimagine the process even of theology, of how we're thinking about and implementing a faith, particularly for those when we think about the African diaspora, so much of it was just so tainted by the church, the holding cells, the punishment, and these beginnings of colonization. How do we move beyond that? And, and how do you even decipher what is what? And I know that's a kind of, because I'm feeling a lot of things as I'm even asking the question, but, but, but can you address that at all? How, how do you siphon that out when it's like the sand, it's all mixed in so together? Very difficult indeed, very, very difficult indeed. But it brings to, to light uh, what human beings can be when they are, they've moved far away from God and what, yeah, when they've moved far away from God. And I was saying, looking at when I visited that uh, 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 slave space myself, mm -hmm. it is the humiliation that women continue to suffer today. Right. That yes, it was a historical event, but uh, we saw it in the Bible, in the book of Esther, what was the king doing when he had all these virgins? They went in and when they came out, they went to his harem. So the violation that continues about on, on women to, to date. But for me, it's not to deny, it, but to acknowledge it. How have we acknowledged uh, 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 that kind of evil? Because acknowledging it means that there should be economically mm. empowered women who do not have to sell their bodies to date. Mm. That that particular space, human beings have been taken away, but we still have more than slavery. Yes. So for me, the apology that has been given has not been acted upon when Jesus says, go and don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I think we go and continue to do it. That's what I'm saying, we acknowledge it. And we should, Africa should be a rich space, but right. we still have human trafficking. We still have uh, 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 slavery, more than slavery going on. Why? Why does Africa continue to be exploited while they're being told that you are very spiritual. Mm. 
what is the connection between spirituality and poverty? Yes. Yes. Why are we not moving away from what I said, the giving motif? And sometimes what is given is not what is needed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other than developing a mutuality where we partner. Yes. Well, that was so powerful when you talked about that tension, uh, giving versus sharing. Because if I come into an experience with the thought that I am here, and when I think, when I think about development work so much, that's what it is, right? Like I'm gonna come in, in fact, the group I was with, it was very similar, right? We're gonna come in and we're going to give this to a people where that may not have been the, the thing that they considered uh, most important. I wanna to touch on, on also this Kairos moment that we're sitting in. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, many are sharing my my own experience in reference to feeling like something is happening or has happened even from this very experience. And so when thinking of the Kairos moment from a convening like this, Dr. Mambo, what do you see as possible? So if we just, if we shrink the Kairos down to this gathering, what in your mind is possible from this for those who are gathered here and have been for the last two days? I think part of the challenge of, uh, uh, if I talk about of people of the African descent and us who are in the continent, is that we have not been able to speak to each other. We have spoken to each other through mediums. Mm those who have told us about the Africans in the diaspora, and those who have told those in the diaspora, the Africans in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. The Kairos moment is that we need to talk to each other yeah. so that we have the right image of each other. We don't seem to have that right image, right? We need to understand that COVID-19, for example, who has died of COVID-19 mm -hmm. more than the other, mm -hmm. right? COVID-19, who has more vaccines than the other? Right? Those are realities that we have to, to question in terms of healing and health. But we don't have to question them through mediums. Mm -hmm. We have to look at each other in the eye and say, why is it that even when you are in the land of plenty, you are among the people that do not have. And we who, had, who are even in the land of plenty, we continue to be exploited. So the Kairos moment is to look at each other and say, while well, we say we are sisters and brothers, what is the problem? Mm. I don't think we've been able to do that. We've been working through mediums. Mm. Mm. So that even when you come to talk to us about LGBTI, there is another powerful organization that is working against wow. them in the same vicinity. Yes. Why? Mm. When we are talking about matriarchs in Africa, talking about liberation, critiquing culture, there's a powerful organization saying the authority of scripture doesn't allow women to do A, B, C, and D. Why? Yeah. So like Emil Towns has said, we need to be asking that why question. And when we mm -hmm. ask the why question, all of us, then we can find a solution, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I find it interesting that so much of your conversation today and the presentations of yesterday, as well as, as those who spoke today, um, has centered womanist thought in interesting ways. Do you, do you feel that that is going to be part of the healing and hope that comes forth, that those womanist views, even of the divine, um, will be part of our pathway toward hope and healing? I think that we've had lots of these hegemonies, hierarchies, 
that have been based in some form of patriarchal systems in regard to this, yeah, masculine God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why for women, even the matriarchs of Africa is begin to say that no, that kind of hierarchy power is destructive. So like one of the matriarchs writes from Ghana, talking about the mother, father God, mm -hmm. not one God up over the other, but the mother, father God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as women bring that more into the center, challenging this uh, uh, heteronormativity, challenging these hierarchies, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. We have even seen spaces where women were leaders during COVID, that the challenges were not as bad as where the males were leaders. Mm. This COVID has given us some, something to, to ponder about. That's why I call it a, a Kairos moment, that COVID is not showing us the, the kind of how to build a house but the kind of house that we have built yeah. over the years. Yeah, that's great. Um, and that house needs to be brought down for us maybe to rebuild a new house. Mm, yes. Um, as Evelyn, while um, we normally wanted the questions to be written, um, I will uh, make space for a, a brief question to Dr. Mambo, and then we'll be closing out uh, this segment and preparing for the next. So uh, Evelyn, please. I'm sorry, that was an error. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. I'm going, is she talking to me? I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It was an accidental hand raise. Um, Dr. Mumbo, is there any closing remark you would like to make um, as we're moving on? And I, I just thank you. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for, for giving me the, 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 the space, and I look forward to to more interactions of, of, of this kind, because they, they are not only uh, challenging, but they are also a family. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Let's give another hand for Dr. Mambo.